Hey there, my name is Robert Reynolds and in today's video we're going to be talking about something I was very challenged with early on in my investing journey. When management put up positive returns on excess income, the question is what's a fair and good quality return for shareholders? I never knew the answer to that because some businesses require more assets than other in order to generate positive returns. And so what's a fair hurdle rate? After a while I understood that each business has a different capital structure. Some businesses are financed more through, let's say, debt than equity, and we can come up with what's known as the weighted average cost of capital. So if a management team is generating a return on their invested capital, for argument's sake, below that weighted average cost of capital, they're not positively adding to shareholder value long term. And so we can use this as a hurdle rate to understand whether management are doing a good quality job at investing our capital for us. So without wasting any time, let's get straight into it. For this example, we are going to use Crocs. We are going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, and then at the very end, we're going to cross-reference the weighted average cost of capital for Crocs with the return on invested capital. We want to understand whether management are delivering shareholder value long term. This might look a little bit scary. Most things in finance are made out to be very difficult, but it's, they're, they're actually very simple concepts. When you break it down in its easiest form, the stuff is really not that difficult. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna explain each of these three sections. So we've got capital structure at the top, cost of equity in the middle, and at the bottom we've got the after-tax cost of debt, and then we're calculating the weighted average cost of debt. All of that might seem difficult, but it's really simple. We're gonna explain it over here, and as we explain it, this is the calculations. So you'll be able to take where, where each of these numbers go, figure out the calculation, the input calculation, and it should make a hell of a lot of sense. You should be able to recreate this fairly easily. So let's get straight into it. Let's calculate the equity structure. Every business has a different capital structure. Um, some businesses are financed more so through debt as opposed to others. And therefore, the cost of capital might be very different depending on covenants and structure of those loans, the interest rates and all that type of stuff. So every business has a different capital structure and so the weighted average cost of capital is gonna be different for every business. That's why it's important to break it down for each individual company. What we need is the total debt. Now, if you went over our video on the balance sheet, I'll leave a link just above here. On the balance sheet, we break down debt. Total debt on a balance sheet includes capital leases, so it's important to go into the liability section of the balance sheet, take out short-term borrowings, current portion of long-term debt, and long-term debt, and add them together, and make sure there's no leases included in there. We want the market value of the firm's debt, just add it all up, input it here. After that, we want the market value of the firm's equity. This is its market cap. So, in this case, 4.4 billion, pop it in there. Add both of those together, that's the total capital structure. Now we wanna know as a percentage of the total, what is debt? Add these two together and then divide debt by the total. It's 38.52%. Market cap, 61.48%. We don't need that right now. We need that later on to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, but we don't need that right now. Very simple, just collect some data, leave it at the top just for a moment. Now what we need to do is figure out what the cost of equity is and the after-tax cost of debt. So the cost of equity, we're going to use what's known as the capital asset pricing model or CAPM. You might have heard of this before. It's a very, very, very simple thing. That's, it's built to figure out what the expected return is of a specific individual equity. How do we understand what that expected return is? Well, we figure out what the risk-free rate is. The risk-free rate's usually the 10-year bond, US Treasuries, that's essentially what we normally use. Now there's nothing truly risk-free, so take that statement with a pinch of salt, but we'd be using usually the 10-year bond yield. As of right now, it's in and around 4.5%, and it fluctuates day to day, so I'm just gonna pop in there 4.5% as the risk-free rate. I should have very low risk investing in the US 10-year bond yield, and I should be able to collect 4.5% over that period. So that's somewhat risk-free. Below there's equity risk premium. What is equity risk premium? It's very simple. What's the premium above the risk-free rate that we earn by taking extra risk, risk owning equities because they're not essentially risk-free? How does, what essentially does that mean in more practical terms? Well, if you look at the S&P 500, 
over the past 100 years, dividend reinvested, it's delivered 10.1% compounded. Not consistently in a straight line, some years in excess of 20%, some years down as much as 50%. It fluctuates, but on average over the past 100 years, it's generated roughly 10.1% on average, dividend reinvested. And so the equity risk premium is the premium above that risk-free rate that we would have earned by owning equities. So when you understand what that is, it makes a little bit more sense to understand what equity risk premium is. Now, it's a little bit difficult to calculate this moving forward because we're speculating what the forward expected returns of the market are going to be. Now, given that we have an understanding of historical context, the market grows. Why does it grow 10.1% in terms of the equity? A couple of different factors. Factor number one would be inflation. Factor number two would be GDP growth. And factor number three would be different variables such as buybacks. Earnings grow at 7 to 10% per year. And over the long term, equities tend to uh, follow that earnings growth. There's a little bit of multiple expansion and contraction along the way. But the longer term expectation for equities the longer you're looking out, the more consistent the equity risk premium estimates likely to be. 5.6%, I could choose a random number, but I chose to go over to Statista and look at the most recent equity risk premium, which was 5.6%. That's where I got that from. And then below there, we have what's known as beta. Beta is a volatility metric. Again, very simple stuff. Beta is very easy to find on most websites. The five-year beta is usually what's displayed. But if you can't get beta, it's very simple to calculate. We also have a video here on the channel explaining that. Beta is a calculation which is figuring out the slope of the line. And beta is, if I'm to give you an idea of what essentially it means is, for every 1% move in the S&P 500, you'd be expecting the beta, so in this case 1.95, you'd be expecting this individual equity to grow at about 1.95%. So that's essentially what beta is telling us. It's telling us the relationship between, with volatility between an individual company and the underlying market. And what we're expecting to learn is what the equity, what, what essentially the opportunity cost would be by looking at the cost of equity. If the markets to go up 15% or down 15% it could hit us a little bit. So how we calculate this very, very, very simple calculation. We're taking the risk-free rate. We're adding the equity risk premium. We're adding both of those together. As you can see here, they're both added together and we're adjusting it for beta. So we multiply it by beta and that gives us a percentage. That is the cost of equity in this case. That would be considered with capital asset pricing model, the expected return because you're adjusting the individual market performance for beta and we should outperform in a bull market. So we should be delivering 15.42% relative to the uh, roughly 9.1% that the risk-free rate and equity risk premium is suggesting we would have. So the calculation is very simple. It's just add both of these together and adjust it for beta. Very simple stuff. And that gives us our cost of equity. Next up we have our cost of debt, but it's the after tax cost of debt. Why after tax? Interest is tax deductible. So we need to figure out what the tax shield is. It's not good enough just to figure out what the cost of debt is. We need to figure out what the tax shield is. So how do we get that cost of debt? A company might borrow 100 million here, 500 million there, a billion here. They all have different maturities. They all have different interest rates. It's very simple. Pop on over to the income statement. Go to the line item that says interest expense. Figure out what that number is. Might be 100 million, might be 120 million, whatever it is. Take that number and divide it by your total debt. And that'll give, the, give you the blended interest rate of the debt of that individual company. Pop that in here, in Croc's, base, in Croc's uh, case, interest is 9.75%, pretty high. So below there, we have a tax rate of 18.5%. That's the effective tax rate. And what we want to figure out is the tax shield. The tax shield is essentially factoring in the tax deduction as well. So the calculation is very simple. We take the cost of debt, as you can see over here, 9.75%, and we multiply that by one minus the tax rate. Very simple stuff. And that gives us the tax shield. So the interest expense by itself is 9.75%. But when we factor in the tax deduction, 
the real interest rate after deducting that interest is 7.95%. Make sense? Because it's a tax deductible, we don't, we're able to save a little bit essentially. So now what we want to figure out is what's the weighted average cost of capital. We know that the cost of equity is 15.42%. We know that the cost of debts 7.95%. So what's the weighted average cost of capital? Very simple. We've got to go back up to the very top of the page here. We calculated what debt was as a total, as a percentage of the total capital structure. And debt was 38.52%. So see over here, we take our after-tax cost of debt, 7.95%, and we multiply that by 38.52%. That's the first part of it. And then we add to that the cost of equity. Again, very simple. We take 15.42% and we multiply that by 61.48%. And that gives us 12.54%. Now, what does that mean? It means that that's our hurdle rate. That's the cost of capital for this business. So as the company reinvests excess income, we want to generate a return above that hurdle rate of 12.54%. So if we pop on over here to Ticker Terminal, which is a platform I use almost every day, you can see that this has been performing quite well recently and the numbers in the whiteboard are slightly off because they just reported and it's up 27% in two days. But you'll see why it's up 27% in two days. So this is Ticker Terminal. We do have a link in the description if you would like to check it out. We'd really appreciate if you used our link. But if we pop on over here and we go down a little bit, we go to financials, we pop on over here to ratios, and we have a look at the return on capital, you can see that over the past number of years, if I change this to bar chart to columns and show labels, you can see that outside of 2016, this has been generating a positive return on invested capital, but since 2018, it's been well in excess of 20%. So much so that in 2021, yes, it was a very good year, they generated 69.84%. That's phenomenally profitable. Now, if we look at trailing 12 months, as of right now, we're trending for the full year in 2022, at 22.7%, factoring in, if you understand this business, an increase of over $2 billion worth of debt to acquire another company. So what is this telling us? Despite the big massive acquisition and the increase in debt and the high cost of debt, this company is generating strong shareholder value because it's far exceeding the cost of capital of 12.54%. 12.54% in cost of capital, they're generating 10% in excess of that, which is a fantastic performance. There are companies that will generate below average returns. And if it doesn't meet that hurdle rate, you're not generating strong um, shareholder value. Management are just not uh, generating strong shareholder value for us as investors in the business. If you're interested, we also have other videos here on the channel going over the return on invested capital and other profitability metrics such as return on equity. Thank you very much for your support and have a great day.